So now I propose everybody is closing its uh, laptop because it's now getting fast. We are starting with the lightning talks and the first talk will be given by Wolfgang Stief. He's introducing the Computer Museum München. And what I understood, it's all about vintage devices and vintage guys playing with vintage devices. Thank you. Hello. I'm waiting for some slides. So yeah, my name is Wolfgang Stief. I'm from uh, Munich <coughs> and I'm uh, heavily involved in something which uh, we call Kreuz Cyber or Computer Museum München. It started all with uh, Kreuz Cyber. Markus, can you? Okay. I have lots of pictures, but the first one is a text slide and I would like to <laughs> bring this to you. No, he's already on the way. Ah, okay, here we go. Okay, so it started with uh, something which is called Cray Cyber. We have uh, some web page, some Twitter handle, and uh, this was a uh, a private collection from uh, first one person, then what was was a bit more. It started around 2000. I'm a team member of, since 2003 there, and we have um, our focus is on scientific computing. So we we are collecting scientific mainframe supercomputers, mostly from control data and Cray. Um, we usually don't pay for this, so we, we, we get them from universities when they are uh, decommissioned, usually. And uh, during the years, we found out that in Munich there are some more people also collecting vintage computing stuff. Usually not these big ones, but uh, smaller ones. You, you all know probably a C64 or uh, some Atari 800 or 1040, stuff like this. And uh, at some point we decided, well, let's make some bigger thing together put all our collections together and at, at the moment we are on the way to build up a computer museum which is more or less privately held but with um, cooperation with uh, university of german armed forces universität der bundeswehr in munich and uh, the nice thing is that so they have um, uh, in in the computer science department they have one group which uh, works on reconstructing old data, um, how to do this, and they, 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 from time to time they need some old machines. So we provide uh, the hardware for them, and they provide us with uh, floor space, with uh, air condition, and with electricity, which is uh, quite important because these are uh, the most um, uh, expensive parts when, when you collect uh, these uh, things. So the Computer Museum München is uh, 25 members around currently. Not all of them uh, are active. Some are just there because uh, it's fun to be there, speak with the people. I would say something around half of the people are active collectors, um, all have their own specialities, their own realms, um, where they are collecting stuff and uh, repairing stuff, all the things. For for Chris Iber, our, um what we have... Um, really in focus is not only collect the machines and put them there to, to fuel them, but you also want to restore them and run them as they were run 10, 20, 30 years uh, before. Next up, I have uh, some pictures for you. So yes, it's still volunteer, um, although we have uh, big machines as well. This was a transport we had from uh, Swiss Bank from Zurich to Germany. We had lots of fun at uh, the Swiss Export Customs and German Import Customs. I can tell lots of stories out there in a the coffee break probably. This is when we uh, went into our current location, which is unfortunately closed for several years now because the roof is instable. There is some instability there, or at least it's suspected to be some instability there. Um, so this is when we moved from the old location to this new one. This is a uh, former airplane hangar, which is very, very nice, very big, but uh, we have to uh, go out there. <coughs> the new building is already there. We are uh, currently on the way restoring it, but it's not finished. Plans are for mid-2017. When, when we will be back in operations, uh, problem is that there is German government involved and uh, this makes things very, very slow. But at least it works. <coughs> 
most interesting thing on this picture is the machine up there. This is a tube computer, which is completely self-planned and self-built. It's not finished yet, but I would say two-third to three-fourths is already done. This is the biggest complete machine we have. It's a control data 960 from 1986. It's uh, in the upper left, or in the, more in the middle, it's the, the, the machine itself. Um, the, the, the most left part with, <coughs> with the, um, yeah, <laughs> the most left, no, the most right part, sorry, is the power supply. Then the, 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 the bigger door is the CPU, the smaller door is the memory, uh, memory, and then there is IO subsystem. And all around, you can see, for example, up here in front, this is a um, card reader, high-speed card reader. At the back, we have a high-speed chain printer, some controller units up there for the tape drives, which you can't see here. And the black one is uh, a very, very new machine. It's from 1991, I think, from the same vendor, also control data. This is uh, the Unix corner with control workstations. So you can see a Sun Enterprise 10,000. Then there is a Create J90 with one 32 CPUs, one 16 CPUs. And at the very left, there, for example, there is a two node SGI Origin, um, SGI Origin 2000. <coughs> this is from the uh, Deutsche Wetterdienst in Offenbach, for example. This is uh, some Create T3D. Six, six rack is the maximum uh, configuration for this machine. Uh, it's not running so far. Uh, involves a lot of uh, cabling. Of course, we have some uh, DEC, which was a very important company during the history. There's a DEC PDP-8 with some um, peripheral stuff. Th these are Vexens. <coughs> we have an uh, um, open VMS cluster running on this. We have, of course, as I told, uh, some smaller machines. So this is the um, micro and workstation area of um, next stations up there, this, uh, the black ones. At, at the very back, there is uh, Robotron, the uh, GDR stuff, <clears throat> some uh, Siemens Teletext right in front. All fun parts to play. Uh, one very important thing is to have documentation for all this stuff. We have quite some documentation, but not at all f for all of uh, the machines. Usually when you get a machine from university, it was running there for a few years, then it was decommissioned somewhere in the basement, and uh, at some point somebody decided, mm, let's put them away, and uh, I, I know somebody in Munich, they might be interested. Yes, we are interested, we get the machine, but usually documentation was thrown away years before. And this is really a problem. It's, it's even uh, harder right now because at some point, current supercomputers will also be some museum part. But uh, documentation right now is uh, usually on the web, in the internet, and it's once the, the machine will be um, out of uh, business, you, you can't get uh, from the, uh, the documentation from the vendor sites. So we, we are now collecting documentation for current machines in order to have them available once we might get such a machine in the museum. So since we are on a network conference, <coughs> what about our networks? We have some networks. The thing is that most machines, no, we, we cannot choose the network we want to have. We have to take what we get. So we have some uh, vintage stuff, uh, not so vintage stuff. Um, we, have, we have network equipment for most of them. The problem is, and that's what my idea is here today, uh, we don't have f an idea on how to present network on, or how to present vintage networks and we also don't have the knowledge. So maybe some of you are interested or have some ideas on how to present uh, vintage network in a museum, then just um, in the coffee break come to me. I'm here today and tomorrow as well and I'm open to change uh, ideas with you. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. So now we have seen a high-speed card reader. What's the board rate of this card reader? Oh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, 1,200 cards per minute. Oh. So, I don't know, Whatever this means. Uh, okay. <laughs> the next talk is uh, given by Moritz Frenzel. It's titled Nesting DWDM within CWDM. And as the title says, he will uh, tell us how to pimp legacy CWDM installations, or how not to.
So if I get slides, uh, are those microphones working? I think so, right? Yeah, Marcus needs to speed up. <laughs> you can use this microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Moritz Frenzel, I'm a network engineer for Global Waves, uh, we're Stuttgart-based ISP, and I want to show you a bit about uh, wave dimension multiplexing and maybe how to stack them and that it's not, not all about the magic that some vendors might talk about, it's, in the end it's just physics. Um, so I will spare you the Wikipedia definition, you can read that up if you want to. In the end, what is wave dimension multiplexing? Um, first, you need to understand the concept that light can have multiple colors. Uh, we have seen that. Um, we will just call them wavelength uh, in the WDM market and that's it. Uh, you can join them using a multiplexer and then you can transport more than one signal over a fiber, that's it. And that's WDM in easy, I guess. Um, there are multiple parts of WDM. Uh, we have CWDM, which I assume some of you have known. Um, quick hands up, anyone ever done CWDM? Yeah, you know, it's quite a few. Um, so CWDM, um, in the end, what, what most of you might know is that we have a center wavelength range. Um, it starts with 1271 nanometers and goes to 1611. We have a channel spacing of 20 nanometers, um, so with 1271, 1279, S 1271, 1271, and so on. Um, but what we really care about is the filter pass bandwidth. Um, for the sake of this talk, I, I always focused on things that are typical and things you can buy. There are lots of other variations out there, but let's just stick to, to what the market has to offer. So we have this 30 nanometers um, for the filter pass bandwidth. If we were to um, look at one channel, let's say we take 1511 nanometers, um, we have a center wavelength 1511 and we have a channel width of 20 nanometers, meaning our channel starts at 1501 and ends at 1521. Um, but what we really care about is the filter passband, um, this, this one here. This is in the end where we can put our light. Um, so we have the 30 nanometers uh, of space where we can put basically any signal and our filter will allow us to pass any light in, in this range uh, through it. So if we keep that in mind and go over to dense wave dimension multiplexing, um, we don't have the center wavelength. We here focus on a center frequency, which is 193.1 terahertz. Um, yeah, it's also a, a wavelength in nanometers, but yeah, just, just for that. Um, we have multiple channel spacings. Um, most typically is probably 100 gigahertz. Um, you can have 50 gigahertz. You can even go to, I don't know, down to 12.5 or even 6.5 if I'm not mistaken. But also for the sake of what is typical, we will use uh, 100 gigahertz here. Um, filter passband is a thing that is rather hard to research. Um, you will, uh, it took me quite some time uh, to find some values for that. It's for 100 gigahertz, typically 0 .0, uh, 0 0.11 nanometers, uh, but we don't need it here. Um, in the end, we, when we take the 100 gigahertz grid, uh, we have uh, 73 possible channels. And uh, for historic reasons, I think uh, we, we used um, channel 20 to 59. There are some from channel 21 to 60. Um, in the end, it was just from back in the day when fiber wasn't as good as it is today. Um, so where we had problems with water peak and whatnot. So typical channel ranges you can buy if you go out there and want to buy a big uh, WDM system, the WDM system, you will get channel ranges 20 to 59 or 21 to 60, depending on the vendor you choose. Um, what does this give us? And I think um, in the end, what we need to care about are the wavelengths. Um, on the top, we have the CWDM channels. And what I said earlier, or what, what my presentation was about, is I want to fit DWDM into a CWDM. So I will just pick uh, channel 59 here and try to fit it somewhere. So wavelength somehow seem to match with the CWDM uh, 1531. And uh, if we give a closer look here um, to the 1531 channel um, and take in care of the passband that our uh, filter has, 
um, we can take all wavelength or all DWDM channels with which are in the range of 1524 to 1537 nanometers and put them into this 1531 CWDM channel, which means we can pick or uh, choose all green channels and stick them into the CWDM channel. Um, same for channel 20. Well, we don't have a corresponding CW channel, so we have to maybe look around the other channels we have. Uh, in the end, we can take all these channels here and fit them into the 1551 CWDM channel. Um, this is maybe just for something you, you might want to look up later in the slides, but in the end, for a conclusion, we can go ahead and take uh, channels 59 to 51 and put them into our CWDM 1531 channel, which in the end allows us to, yeah, well, use eight more channels on our old CWDM system than we were, were used to. And same goes for 1551. This even gives us uh, 14 more channels. So we have a slight upgrade on that. Um, whether you want to use this or not is basically up to you. It is for sure just something you want to do in the metro. So please don't go ahead and try to put this on an amplifier or whatever. Um, also, if you are considering upgrading a CWDM by putting some DWDM in there, please go ahead and uh, talk to your respective manufacturer because all values I just chose are in the end from either my vendors or from uh, stuff I found on the internet. So you, you want to go ahead and talk to your vendor. Um, obviously, stacking multiplexers adds attenuation to the systems and um, if you ever are to debug something like this, please don't go ahead and use those cheap uh, power meters because they will misguide you. They don't have an understanding of what the center wavelength is. Uh, what you're seeing there, please go ahead, use an OSA. They're a bit more expensive, but uh, in the end, that is what you want to do. Um, I think as this is a lightning talk, uh, I will sk skip the questions and we can talk at Beering or whatever. Uh, I'm around for all days, or just hit me up on Twitter or Facebook or IRC, or just pop me an email. So thank you. Thank you, Moritz. So in the next lightning talk, okay, in the next lightning talk, Jan, I think Chermak. Yeah, okay. Jan Charmak is uh, going to tell us something about the Turis Omnia router and the corresponding open source project. Uh, yes. Yeah, so hi, uh, my name is Jan and I'm here to tell you a short story about the Turis Omnia router. I hope you won't fall asleep uh, be before your coffee. Uh, so first, let me introduce myself and us. Uh, unlike many of you, I'm not a network engineer. I'm a software developer working for CZNIC Labs. Uh, we are uh, R&D department at CZNIC, so it's a Czech top-level domain registry. And we use the money from domains for some interesting projects like the bird routing daemon or not DNS server and recently also Resolver. But the project I will be talking about now is the project Turis, which started over three years ago, and it's where our story begins. Maybe I'll ask, does uh, anybody in here heard about it already? Cool. Quite many people. <laughs> so, uh, just briefly, project Turis was a research project, internet security research project, uh, that was aiming at the uh, the end user segment of the internet, and we wanted to know what happens there, where all those dump uh, CP devices are. So uh, we wanted to do some analysis on, on the devices itself and so on, and we need some powerful hardware uh, that the analysis would be carried on. So we made uh, this thing called the tourist router. Uh, it was a dual core power PC, uh, device with two gigabytes of RAM uh, running OpenWRT fork uh, with some customizations like automatic updates and, and similar things. And 
we made uh, 2,000 of these devices and uh, gave them basically for free or technically for one check crown uh, that the people don't have to pay uh, so for free. And in, uh, if the people agree that they, they will provide us some data from the devices. And this device was made completely open as open hardware that was running open source software. And when we went to conferences with this and talking about the project, uh, many people told us, hey, I want this device, uh, take, uh, I want to take it home, I want to buy it, where can I, where can I buy it? And we couldn't sell it uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first one, it was quite expensive. And the second one was that we didn't expect uh, that uh, demand for such a device. So we thought, uh, what could we do about it? So we created uh, a different device. We thought that we will make something um, cheaper and lighter. So at first we called it Tourist Light, but then we were able to design something that was even better. And uh, we called it Tourist Omnia. Uh, so basically it's better on all, in all the aspects. Uh, but about it later, uh, this thing came to life thanks to a crowdfunding campaign uh, on Indiegogo that started roughly a year ago. Uh, we managed to raise 1.2 million US dollars. That means it's the same amount as the number of Czech domains. And uh, what's, what's inside this box? As I said, it's completely open, open software, open source software, open source hardware. Uh, the core is uh, dual-core ARM, uh, ARM uh, CPU at 1.6 gigahertz. It has one or optionally two gigabytes of RAM, eight gigabytes of flash. Uh, it has six, uh, six gigabit uh, Ethernet ports. Uh, one of them is uh, directly wired to the CPU and is shared with, uh, with an SFP connector. So you can plug there some SFP module. Uh, if you visit uh, uh, the Nokia showcase uh, here, uh, we have there uh, a demo of, uh, of Omnia running and DSL module. So it's completely self-contained DSL uh, CPE. Uh, it has uh, other interesting things and I hope if it works, yeah. So this is uh, for many people the killer feature, it has RGB user configurable LEDs uh, and that are also dimmable so it's really cool if you don't like those uh, blue shiny things that shine in your eyes. Uh, it's definitely a thing you, you want to have at home. Uh, it has USB 3, two USB 3 ports, three mini PCI Express slots, etc. etc. Uh, the software inside is again uh, OpenWRT fork with automatic updates. Uh, if you don't want to use that one, you can also, uh, well, th there's currently some upstreaming effort for the uh, Vanilla OpenWRT, or now LEDE, or LEED, sorry. Uh, and there's also effort to make upstream support for Debian and OpenSUSE. So I think that's, that's all I wanted to say here. And the last thing, uh, if you want to take part in this story, and if you didn't, uh, if you haven't done that already, you can buy it. Uh, it's uh, available through uh, retailers like Amazon.de or Alza Shop here in Germany. Uh, and it's also available for distributions. So if you're interested about it, just contact me. I can tell you some details. And I think that's it. So if you have got some questions, you can catch me around. If you want to talk about the hardware, software, or if you want to start your own hardware startup, I will tell you why not to do so. So <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. So we have two more lightning talks, which I think are not yet on the website, but that's the surprise of the day. Uh, the next will be given by Thomas King. Uh, you already saw him in the morning. He's with DKIX and will tell you something about um, standardization of the black hole community. 
Thank you. So it's me again. Um, I have been the poster boy for black holing for just some time already. Um, and I will give you an update on what we have done. No, I think that's not my slide deck. Something, something similar? Yeah, that's mine. Perfect. Do you see the same thing? Ah, we have different uh, screens. I, I just saw what um, Marcus was doing, right? <laughs> it's funny. Okay. Um, anyway, um, I would like to give you an update on what we have done on the black holing side, um, RFC 799. And uh, let me quickly introduce you into the idea on um, black holing. It was already covered in two presentations uh, this morning, one, um, one from KPN. They covered it perfectly well. Um, but let me uh, stress one one issue what we have seen actually in 2014 when black honing was more or less um, introduced new to IXPs. Um, there, for instance, at DKIX, uh, we were providing the black honing service. And if you as a customer would like to use the black honing service, um, you had to uh, use um, a rewriting of uh, next hop IP addresses in the BGP announcements. Um, and that's sometimes quite annoying. Um, so we were thinking about a different signaling mechanisms um, to, to use um, or to trigger a, a black hole. And um, during, during that step, we realized that other XPs providing this kind of services, and I have a selection here um, on this slide, um, have different, different triggers for black holing. And... Um, um, in the discussions we had with, with our customers, we realized that it's quite annoying and cumbersome and error prone that um, every IXP and also ISP comes up with their own solution how to trigger black hole. Um, so we were thinking about um, yeah, how to resolve that issue and we were um, finally uh, coming to a solution that is named Black Hole BGP Community. So it's a well-known BGP community that can be used by everyone. Um, and um, that, that can be easily implemented in, in filters and um, BGP announcements. And um, though we were talking to the ITF and Tiana about um, this um, uh, well-known uh, Black Hole BGP community, we were working on an internet draft with uh, different parties like EuraX, also with, uh, with um, different ISPs like KPN and NTT. Um, and so finally, we, um, we, we came to um, RFC 799, which just defines um, a well-known BGP community um, that can be used for black holing. Um, and that's already available. So um, actually, it was issued uh, to, yeah, already four, 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 five, six weeks ago. And so we were... Uh, talking to BGP speakers uh, that they support this um, this black hole BGP community, and here we have a list of um, of BGP speakers supporting this already. So Bird is already it's also a uh, Nixie set project, by the way. Um, it's uh, already um, supporting uh, RC seven triple nine Go BGP as well. Open BGPD. Peter is here. Thanks for that. Um, Extra BGP support that uh, Quagga. It's requested, um, but not supported yet. We also have a, an open ticket with Nokia. Um, what we didn't do yet is we didn't talk to Cisco, Juniper, Procade, and Huawei yet. But um, Peter from NixiZ told me this morning that they will open a, a ticket with Cisco so that we get, will get it, um, support there as well. But if you... Uh, would like to see that happen, please go to your vendor and talk to them and um, please make it happen that they support RFC 7999. Um, if we look on, on the IXPs and ISPs already um, supporting um, the Black Hole BGP community, we have already uh, 44 IXPs supporting um, this, um, of course, DKIX, we were driving that a bit, so we, we were one of the first supporters. Then we have um, all the Equinix guys, that's pretty cool. Um, the people from Moscow supported already, um, and others as well. Also, Community IX, um, Theo, thanks for that. Um, thanks for the support. Um, also, on the ISP side, uh, we have already seen some uh, pickup, um, especially KPN. 
Thanks, KPN. Um, and smaller ISPs and, um, and hosters as well, like Stus11 and um, Theo, thanks again for that. Um, and uh, Christian from Strato support that as well. Great. Thanks. So what we are trying to... Um, or the, this is actually the purpose of um, of this lightning talk is that everybody who is providing black holing services to their customers or is using black holing services, please have a look at um, RFC 7999 and um, support it in, in terms of that you honor this well-known BGP community so that others can easily use um, your black hole service. So that's pretty much it. Um, Two links um, to to some doc um, further documentation here. The uh, RFC seven triple nine, and I have set up a um, um, a GitHub project where I collect all this um, this information that is here in in the presentation as well. Um, so if you are uh, an uh, ISP or carrier or whatever um, you do with, uh, within the internet and you provide black holing services and you um, you support RFC seven triple nine, please let me know so that so that I can put it here on the um, on the GitHub website so that people can see that this is well supported. So thank you very much again and a special thanks for all of you who contributed to um, to this effort uh, with comments, with feedback, um, uh, also with, with critics, Stefan for instance. Um, so thank you very much for that. That helped really make this happen and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I think that uh, there's something we achieved as a community um, that black holing and fighting leaders um, is easier now. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. So last but not least, it's my exceptional pleasure to uh, introduce myself as uh, the last lightning talk. Um, I'm, it's, now it's not just me between you and coffee. I will try to make this as a quick as possible, but obviously as long as necessary. Um, okay, here we go. Um, my talk is about uh, a working title, which is uh, APDN for short, or Longer Attack Prefix Distribution Network. And the aim is to motivate you to fight DDoS together. <clears throat> and the point really is we should do this together. So some sort of background. Um, I mean, it's obviously, some subset of this audience here feels annoyed by uh, by DDoS attacks, and some of them understood that uh, DDoS attacks can't be mitigated locally. I'm pretty sure that most of you understand this. Um, well, then we, we we sit together and uh, talk about this, these issues and what we can do. And um, some of us are using a service called UTRS. We'll come to that a bit later, and which. It's quite a nice idea, but we see some deficiency, and especially we are not sure how this service will evolve in the future. <coughs> when I'm talking about some of us, here are some names. I'm not going to read them. I'll leave the slide for some seconds so you can have a look at it. Um, this, this list should not be finished, so we hope you see the necessity as well, and um, we hope you join us in, in our effort. So what do we want to do? And first, what is um, Atos or UTRS? I'm not sure how it's pronounced correctly, but I think it doesn't matter. Um, who of you has heard of it? If you see the name, if you see the logo? Okay, quite some. Um, in essence, it's uh, an open and public black holding route server. You can uh, set up a BGP session with this uh, route server, which is run by Team Kamru. And um, via that route server, you will receive uh, slash 32 prefixes which are currently under attack and where you shouldn't send traffic to. That's the very short message. Um, currently, I think it has around about 120 participants. Is that right? Okay. And uh, what we've heard in the queue for some weeks, I think some months, are another 100 participants. But unfortunately, there are some issues within Team Kamru which um, hinder them from bringing up these new peers. Um, aside that, there are uh, different uh, other issues we see. First, um, this, this service is run by one entity, so in, the, in essence it's a single point of failure. If it fails, then your, your uh, last line of defense fails, which is quite bad. 
Um, we noticed in the in the last uh, week some some or several longer outages of this service, which um, may be due to the reason that the the person, which is called John Christoph, who initially um, developed and invented this service within uh, Team Camru, has left the company. And after that, we have the feeling, uh, by looking at how this is run, that um, there is not that much effort in in further promoting and extending this service. <coughs> So, which uh, in the end you see there are no new features, there are many feature requests, but no new features get added to the service. <coughs> and as we think this is actually a good idea to to uh, to have some some kind of distribution network or black hole route server, we, we came up with the idea and the vision to develop something on a more resilient, more stable, uh, more global base. So, in essence, the idea is to establish a network of currently in the first step of route service, which uh, distribute um, um, prefixes under attack, but not run by a single entity, but run by different local or regional communities. So, for instance, DNOC could be a German community who could provide uh, such service, and an LNOC or NANOC could be a community which could, could run uh, additional node. We have some, um, some, some feature set in mind. So first, of course, we would like to have feature parity with UTRS, which is very straightforward, very simple. But uh, then the service is missing IPv6 support, even if you don't see that much attacks on IPv6 prefix today. This might change in the future. Um, also, it might be a good idea to add BGP flow spec. Also, Marcus doesn't like it, but that shouldn't hinder us from implement implementing it. Um, and of course, we could think about some some kind of selective black holding being supported by such service, which in essence means we just need a solid concept of how to how to selectively announce or control the announcement of prefixes to the peers via BGP communities. <coughs> but in the end, there is room for improvement. There's room for ideas, and we could do even better than just. Um, uh, just uh, exchanging prefixes under attack, we could also exchange attack patterns in the end. But this is some kind of vision which is, I don't know, three, five, ten years plus or something like that. So this is where it, this could develop to. <coughs> to make the idea once more more clearer, and afterwards I'm going to formulate a question. Some of you might know or might be able to guess what this question will be. Um, we are looking into a distributed setup. We want uh, this kind of route servers being run in different places, being maintained by different communities, which um, allow us to spread uh, very in a very wide range globally, and which allows us to uh, to get in touch with even enterprise autonomous systems or every downstream AS you may imagine. This is only possible if you ask us if you have a globally distributed network. And uh, the, the obvious idea would be to start uh, such an initiative by running uh, what we would call the e-node um, in the Deno community. And that would be something you. Um, if you. If you look at the e this is currently a uh, what is it? It's a, it's a forum where people meet, which is quite nice, but if we would run such a service as the Enoch with the De Enoch label, that would be much more, would require some kind of um, yeah, professional service attitude or however you might call. And um, the interesting question would be, is this something that uh, you as the Enoch could uh, imagine? that we run a service under the De Enoch label and start such initiative as De Enoch. And to that question, I would like uh, to have your opinion. So maybe you could raise your hands, or if someone would like to comment, then feel free to use the microphone. But remember, it's coffee time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Oh, not only coffee, there are also t-shirts. So, So, so can you show your hands? Anyone has, or how should we start? So, who would like to have such an initiative being run by Dinoc? Okay, who doesn't care? 
and the remainder is against it. So who's against it? Oh. Two. OK. So from the hands, I would say we should um, continue discussing this. And uh, we will. OK. So thank you very much. Um, we'll probably start discussing this on the mailing list. We will maybe come out with a website. Um, we try to keep you informed. Talk to any one of the guys who have been listed on the second or third slide. Um, we can explain you more what we want to do. OK, that's it for my talk. That's it for the first session. Thank you very much for attending, for participating. <laughs> Enjoy coffee and see you again at 4 p.m. <laughs>